Way before Sega had any speech sampling attached to its logo, even before the Master System arrived on our living room floors, Sega executives were concerned. The early 1980s witnessed a downturn in arcade use, primarily in Japan, and at the time Sega Enterprises Incorporated, who in the States were then a subsidiary of Gulf and Western, were one of the top five arcade game manufacturers throughout the world. Rather than collapsing in panic, Sega noticed an opportunity to expand into the home gaming market, something which a company known as Nintendo had also eyeballed. And in the summer of July 1983, the Sega SG-1000 was launched. And that's not related to the Yamaha Hi. guitar, by the way. Now this happened to coincide with the exact same day that Nintendo released the Japanese version of the NES, known as the Famicom. So although the NES is often compared to the Master System in Western regions, in Japan, Sega's competing offering at the time was actually the predecessor to the Master System, and was technically inferior to Nintendo's Famicom system. The SG-1000 was also released in Taiwan, Australia and some European markets, often distributed and sold under different names. In the States, an unauthorised clone popped up which was able to play SG-1000 games alongside ColecoVision releases, clearly a time before lawsuits were fashionable. Alongside the SG-1000, Sega also released the SC-3000, which was essentially the same machine just with a keyboard, to allow computing crossovers for customers who wanted a seat in both of these upcoming worlds. Shortly after its release, Gulf and Western sold their arcade division to Bally Manufacturing, but retained Sega's North American research and development operation. Over in Japan, Sega's management were involved in a buyout bid and the company was bought by CSK Corporation, a leading Japanese software company. This soon after led to the release of the SG-1000 Mark II in July 1984. The Mark I had been somewhat of a commercial failure, partly due to the success of Nintendo's more powerful machine, but also because it was entering a playing field with several other already released different game machines, including offerings from Takara, Bandai and Casio, not to mention the American systems such as the Intellivision and the Atari 2600. In light of this, Sega's solution, and this would become their tradition throughout every generation of hardware, was to stick the hardware in a different case and remarket it. Now the SG-1000 Mark II sold at the same price as the original, 15,000 yen, but did feature a few hardware tweaks, including detachable controllers and the ability to play Sega card games, which would become common on early Master System releases. You can also see that the case design took a significant step towards the look of the Mark I Master System, and even more so when compared with Japan's version of the Master System, the Mark III. Ironically, the Master System II design would later take a backward step to that of the SG-1000 Mark I, so clearly fickleness was a strong attribute throughout the Sega Corporation. Now, as SG-1000 software was fully compatible with the Mark II, official cartridge production ran from July 1983 through to February the 18th, 1987, when the last cartridge game, Portrait of Loretta, was sold. However, Sega did build backwards compatibility into the Mark III, so that this library was not lost on users upgrading to their latest machine. Although, sadly, the cartridges are simply too big to fit in our master systems. Opening up a Mark II box, you find a couple of Japanese adverts featuring some dinky cars? Man, I just love Japanese stuff, even if I can't read it. There's also a warranty card, an instruction manual depicting you should probably avoid hitting your machine with a hammer, screwdriver, the sun, and... Wait, what is that? Coffee machine? The console itself is snugly packed in styrofoam, with the updated SJ150 controllers housed on either side of the machine, a design which was inspired by Nintendo's more successful Famicom. In contrast to the Mark I, these controllers are detachable and plug into the back rather than the front of the unit, a commendable design implementation which almost certainly helped its wider success. You also get little joystick nubs you can attach to the D-pads, but in practice, these are completely useless. On the top you find an easy to find pause button, a familiar doored cartridge slot, and on the front you'll find your regular power button. 
Also, in contrast to most modern design, the expansion port sits on the front of the unit and allows attachment of accessories, including the additional keyboard. The keyboard allowed you to effectively upgrade the machine to its computer counterpart, the SC3000, allowing access to various software packages available at the time, including a music package and a basic interpreter. The keyboard itself is very Sinclair Spectrum-esque, with spongy rubber keys, ear and mix sockets to save and load basic programs, and a printer connector, I think? You can also get a variety of other expansions for the console, including a steering wheel, for that authentic driving experience, and proper joysticks. I picked my SG-1000 Mark II up for about 150 quid, including the keyboard, which I consider somewhat of a bargain. I also secured a bundle of cartridges imported from Japan for a few quid. Under the shell of this powerhouse is a Zilog Z80 CPU running at 3.58 MHz. Interestingly, the SC3000 ran at 4 MHz, and this was the same CPU which would later work its way into the Master System and Mark III consoles. Video processing is controlled by a Texas Instrument TMS 9928A, capable of displaying 16 colours. This is in comparison to the 64 of the Master System. Sound was handled by a Texas Instrument SN 76489, and the system provides 8 kilobytes of RAM and 16 kilobits of video RAM. Power is provided through your bog standard 9 volt DC adapter. The system itself has no composite output unlike the Master System Mark 1, so your only option is the bog standard RF lead. Now this machine drew many comparisons with the ColecoVision console in the graphics and capability stakes, and when you realise that the CPU, video and sound chips were identical in both systems, it becomes clear why this was. Taking a look at the cartridges, you can see that they're bigger affairs than what later Sega systems would become used to, but could still cut in smaller than the beastie slabs that you had to carry to your typical Nintendo Entertainment System. The lifespan of the system saw the release of 68 cartridges and 29 lower capacity Sega card releases, although we're only talking a few kilobytes for entire games. And this required the additional card catcher accessory to load. 26 of the cartridge releases require the optional keyboard accessory if you're not using the SC3000. Now, titles include Monaco Grand Prix is the strangest depiction of a Monaco Grand Prix I've ever seen. Dragon Wang, who has the best hump walk I've ever seen and kicks like he's trying to turn the oven off. Pitfall 2, featuring Laurel apparently searching for Hardy. Starjacker, which I quite liked. Congo Bongo, a Donkey Kong clone with a questionable name but plays quite well. Sega Gallagher, which is a reasonable attempt at Namco's Gallagher, but with god awful sound effects. Uh, Golgo 13, which sees you blasting out train windows to free passengers. Whoa! Shit, that guy is scary. Girls Garden, a known Japan, I suspect that this might be a euphemism. It was the first game to be directed by Yuji Naka, who would go on to create that wonderful blue hedgehog. And it features some really nice graphics. Then we have Elevator Action, one of my all-time favourites. And check out that double leg kick! Whoa! Flicky, which sucks. Hero, which sucks. James Bond 007, which double sucks. And Hang On 2, which is surprisingly good. No, I lied, it sucks, major style. Also, Music Station actually features some actual, real music samples, which I find frankly incredible. Now, originally all software shipped with both English and Japanese instructions, but following the lacklustre take-up of the machine, this was switched to just Japanese in later releases. In terms of playability, it's a slight step up from playing a ColecoVision or an Atari 2600 release. The standard control pads are very spongy, incredibly more so even than a Master System pad. Plus, having the leads located on the side is actually quite a hindrance. 
But regardless, some titles such as Starjacker are actually pretty fun to play, and bar the NES, it still beats most of the competition around during its time. Sega! With the Sega Master System, or Mark III, being released in 1985, the production run for the SG-1000 series was a short one but one which allowed Sega to establish themselves in the home gaming market. The improved graphics and capabilities of the Mark III over the NES, coupled with the smart move to allow backwards compatibility from the SG-1000 titles, helped Sega gain ground in their home market, and even become dominant in some areas where the SG-1000 was never released, including the UK and Europe. So then, the SG-1000, although not the biggest commercial success and not even released in Western regions, was an inevitable part of Sega's journey. A journey which led to two of my favourite and most played childhood consoles, the Master System and Mega Drive. So, in that regard, I freaking love it. Good work, Sega. Thank you for watching my SG-1000 review. Plenty more videos in the pipeline and plenty more I've already made, so feel free to click one or subscribe if you can, it is greatly appreciated. Thank you for watching and good night.